I am the professor Griselda Barrera Galanda from the Chemical Institute of the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul, that is in Porto Alegre, Brazil. I am going to present you the course Nuclear Magnetic Resonance Applied to Polymers. First of all, I need to remember some basic principles of NMR spectroscopy in a very condensed way just to refresh some concept that we are going to use. Then I will start talking quite briefly of the characterization of polymers by proton NMR, give some examples and resolve some exercises. Subsequently, we will talk about the characterization of polymers by carbon-13 NMR, that it will be the main part of this course. This study includes the quantitative, quantitative analysis by carbon-13 NMR, the optimization of the instrumental parameters. I am going to show mainly the characterization of vinyl polymers that includes inversion and tacticity. Then we are going to see the study of polymerization mechanisms, statistical models, also the copolymers analysis, calculation of common number contents, sequences, and the reactivity ratios, determination of terminal group by NMR, and calculation of molecular weights of polymers. So, let's start with the basic concepts. The nuclear magnetic resonance was discovered by two groups headed by physics in 1945, the group of Purcell from Harvard and the group of Bloch from Stanford. Due to the relevance of these discoveries, Purcell and Bloch got the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1952. As well as ultraviolet and infrared, NMR is an absorption spectroscopy and its range in the electromagnetic spectrum is the radio frequency region. Here we can see the electromagnetic spectrum where the wavelength increases uh, to the right and the energy in frequency to the left. We have the other spectroscopy as the ultraviolet vis visible where occurs the electronic transitions the infrared where the molecules absorb the energy for their vibrational mo movements, microwave where in, is in the range of the rotational energy, and finally radio frequency is the range of the nuclear and electronic spin energy. As you can see, the energy involved in NMR is very small. The fundamental property that should have an atom to present the resonance phenomena is to have a spin, nuclear spin. The spin quantum atom number, I, is related to its mass number, A, and atomic number, Z. If the atomic mass is odd, being the atomic number odd or even, the spin quantum number is half integer. This means a nucleus spinning with a spherical and uniform charge distribution. This is the case of the two main atoms that we are going to study in this course, proton and carbon-13. If the atomic mass is even, being the atomic number odd, the spin quantum number is integer. This means a nucleus spinning with a non-spherical charge distribution, which is described as an electric, an electric quadrupole moment. This is the case of deuterium, for example. When the atomic mass and number are both even, in this case, the atom has spin zero. This corresponds to a nucleus 
that does not rotate around its axis. And this is the case of carbon-12. That is the most abundant isotope of carbon. This is a problem because that means that the only isotope of carbon that can be studied by NMR is carbon-13. And the natural ab abundance of this isotope is very low. A charge in movement creates a magnetic field. In the case of the nucleus, this field is represented by the magnetic moment. This is related to the nuclear spin by the following relationship, where H is the Planck constant and gamma is the geromagnetic constant that is specific for each atom. If a nucleus is subjected to a strong magnetic field, its magnetic moment tends to align itself with the field, promoting energy changes. The nucleus does not align completely parallel to the field, but undergoes a precession movement with a radial frequency called Larmor, representing by omega letter that is in radian per second, and a frequency a new inherent, and both are related by the following equation. The interaction energy between the external field, V0, and the magnetic moment is represented by this equation, where M is the magnetic quantum number with possible values of i, the spin quantum number, i minus 1, i minus 2, till minus i, with total number of possibilities 2i plus 1. For proton and carbon-13 atoms that have a spin quantum number equal to 1 half, there are two quantum numbers plus one half and minus one half, representing two possible orientation of the spin in the presence of a magnetic moment, parallel or anti-parallel to the external field. The energy of the transition between these two states is directly proportional to the frequency nu, to the nucleus magnetic moment mu, and to the external magnetic field B0. To detect this energy splitting, an electromagnetic radiation of frequency nu should be applied, resulting in an energy absorption that is the phenomenon, phenomenon of resonance. The necessary condition for this quantum and resonant transition in terms of frequency is given by this equation, where the frequency depends directly of the external field B0. In this table, it can be seen that if the external field B0 is, for example, of 70.5 kilogauss, the frequency needed for this energy absorption is 300 megahertz for the proton, and 75 megahertz for the carbon-13. That is a consequence of the differences in zero magnetic constant and consequently different magnetic moment between these two atoms. Other concept that we have to remember is the chemical shift delta that is defined as the shield of the nucleus by the electrons and other neighbor nuclei divided by the applied field and is always measured from a reference, normally TMES, tetramethylsilan. The use of this parameter without units, it is used part per million, is necessary to be able to compare spectra done in different NMR equipments with different external magnetic field. Thus, if a proton has a resonant frequency of 60 Hz, in a 60 megahertz NMR, it will have a frequency of 100 hertz in equipment of 100 megahertz. But the chemical shift, it will be of 1 ppm in both equipments. 
Another important phenomenon is the spin-spin coupling that is especially important in proton NMR and is the splitting of the NMR resonances produced by the contribution to the magnetic field of the spin of the neighbor atoms. In case of proton NMR, each type of proton sends the number of equivalent protons on the carbon atom adjacent to the one to which it is bonded. So, if it has one neighbor, its resonance will be split in two lines. If there is two neighbors, in three. And if there is n neighbors, the resonance will be split in n plus one lines. That is the general case. One of the problems of NMR spectroscopy is the lack of sensitivity due to a small difference in energy between the transitions. For example, in the case of proton, for an applied field B0 equal to 14.1 kilogauss, the differences between the energy levels is around 0.08 joules. As the differences in energy increase with the external magnetic field, one solution to increase sensitivity was to increase the magnet strength. Another factor that can increase sensitivity is to increase, is to increase the number of scans. Then NMR signals are added coherently, whereas noise, as it is random, is added as the square root of the number of scan. The problem to increase too much the number of scan is that also increase the time to obtain a spectrum. The pulse technique is another tool that came to increase sensitivity and resolution of a, a spectra. If it, it involves the collective excitation of nuclei from equilibrium. The number of nuclei disturbed depends on the strength and the duration of the radio frequency pulse. After the pulse, the excited nuclei return to their original state or relax, emitting an electromagnetic radiation called free induction decay or FIT, that is a signal of intensity versus time. The frequencies of each nucleus are extracted from the, this complex signal using a mathematical tool called Fourier transform. In this way, the feed is converted in an spectrum that is a graphic of intensity versus frequency. Let's now remember about the nucleus spin relaxation. There are two allow transitions for the spin one corresponding to an energy absorption and another corresponding to an er energy emission. The spin population follows the Boltzmann distribution. So there is less population of spin in the beta level than in the alpha level. When there is an energy absorption, the spin populations are affected and they must return to their equilibrium. The relaxation time is the time required for the nuclear to return to its equilibrium distribution or the Boltzmann distribution. The excess of nuclei population depends on the strength of the applied external field and as the intensity of the signal depends on the number of excited nuclei the sensitivity and resolution increase with the strength of the magnet. There are two main relaxation times. T1 is the relaxation spin lattice. It's longitudinal because occurs in the direction of the field. In this process, the spin loses their energy to the surrounding in the form of thermal energy and is the responsible for the spin population equilibrium. T2 relaxation spin spin is transversal because occurs perpendicular to the direction of the field and is an energy transfer between spins. As the molecular movement of neighboring 
nuclei in the same molecule are responsible for relaxation process, T1 and T2 are used to study molecular motions in the polymer chain. To know more about basic concepts of NMR, you can refer to the following literature. <music>